We're in Zephaniah chapter 3, and um, one of the things we'll do next week is we're going to see, Ron, this preaching that this prophet is doing, does it bear any fruit? Does it have any particular uh, effect upon people? Well, most of you know that Zephaniah was the preacher who was preaching during the days of King Josiah. And King Josiah was one of the few good kings on the throne of Judah. And uh, the most remarkable revival that God's people had between the time of King David and Solomon until the end of the kingdom, uh, until the Babylonian captivity, the high place was the revivals of Josiah's reform. And we'll talk a little bit about what happened during that reform. So if we're able to do it, and if God's Spirit is in it and honors it, this kind of preaching will be a, bring about some kind of revival if the Lord is so sovereignly pleased to do that. Amen. This is the kind of thing that has to be done if revival comes to a person or to a Sunday school class or to a fellowship group or to a church or to a denomination, or to a nation. If there's any kind of turning back to God, and that's what revival is, it's turning from sin and all that that involves, and turning to God for mercy, and then following through in obedience and service to God. And revival preaching is preaching that has to go down and clean up the roots I'll mention several things that Josiah's revival involved, but I'll just mention one today. Because I mentioned in the service Sunday when we talked a little bit about the, the condemnation that comes upon someone in murder, Jesus said that you're liable to the, the judgment or the civil government. You're liable to the council, that is the church government, but you're also liable to divine judgment. And divine judgment brings about punishment that is, and Jesus said it, I didn't. He said it's hell. It's hell fire. And that word in the uh, Greek is, is usually Gehenna. And what Gehenna refers to is the Valley of Hinnon. You all know the way Jerusalem is situated in a kind of a hill and a mountain that comes up and rises. But there's two very low places. One is a Kidron Valley that comes along the eastern side with a brook or a little river that was one of the aqueducts that gave water to Israel, fresh water. But then there's another valley south of Israel that goes across, and that's the Hinnon Valley. And it, too, is a valley that, that is very depressed and low and has a little bit of water in it most of the time. These are, it, but it was really more of a drainage ditch. It was more of a sewer. And it was also the garbage dump. And it was the place in Jerusalem where they would throw out and haul out of the city and out to this, this valley, this dump, the waste from the city and all the pollution and all the filth would go into Gehenna. And in Gehenna, they would have a fire burning all the time because they needed to burn trash and garbage and dead animals and carcasses. And any kind of criminal or vagrant or anyone that didn't get a decent burial there in Jerusalem, their bodies would be taken out and thrown in the, in the uh, Hinnon Valley, the Valley of Gehenna. Are you getting the picture? And that's the scene, the very vivid scene that Jesus uses to describe hell, the torments of hell and the, the, the outcome in other words, that is the end of all things. That's where the trash goes to be burned. That's where bodies go to be, uh, to be burned and annihilated. And that's why Jesus said that in that valley and in that place, the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And that's the, that's the picture of whatever hell is, whatever hell is like. It's a place of that kind of torment, that kind of misery. But more importantly, it's, a, it's that kind of waste and that kind of absolute uh, getting rid of it in, in every way. It is the place of destruction. And that's what Jesus put forth. And when the prophets preached, they preached of God's 
judgment upon his people. We have misunderstood God so much in this, this generation and in this uh, century that it's not even funny. Most people can't even conceive of Almighty God even having a place like that. And the Bible said it wasn't prepared for his people. It's prepared for the devil and his angels to start with. But he says in the final judgment that hell, Gehenna, will be cast into a lake of fire. And that's the final judgment. And only, I think, when people get a little bit of a, an awareness, when God opens their eyes and, and, and sensitizes their spiritual nerves to where they can hear that, do people develop the fear of the Lord. And then from the fear of the Lord develops a sense of right and wrong and our sense of His holiness and our sinfulness. And then from there, the Lord graciously, this is all the good work of God in salvation. This is prevenient grace working in the soul to bring us to a place where we come to loathe ourselves and our sin. And we come to recognize that we really don't have a very good outcome apart from God's salvation. And they were all kind of in the same boat. And the perfume that is placed over last things that's placed over the doctrine of God's judgment, the doctrine of God's wrath, begins to evaporate in the heat of true godly preaching. There's not a real preacher anywhere that won't be honest enough to tell you that if, he, if he's going to preach the whole counsel of God, he's going to have to tell you about final judgment. And that's what the prophets do over and over and over. One of the reasons that the New Testament doesn't have all of that hellfire and damnation preaching in it is because the prophets did a pretty good job. The prophets had already covered the base. There was a lot of literature already in the Bible about that. And so people had heard that kind of preaching for centuries. What they needed to hear when Christ came was they needed to hear the gospel. Now, the gospel was preached by these old-time prophets, as we'll see in just a moment. But the gospel of the New Testament only makes sense as good news when it's set against the backdrop of all of the prophetic bad news that had been preached to Israel for centuries. Several hundred, almost a millennium of prophetic preaching. And so what we do when we go back and pick up these old prophets is that we're not going back into a world that just never existed or in, into some never-never land of ancient history. We're going back when the Lord was laying it all out. The New Testament is this thick. The Old Testament is this thick because God pretty well covered all the bases in the Old Testament. There's a sense in which you don't even need the New Testament to preach the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say that again? <laughs> There's a sense in which... You don't even need the New Testament, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and, and all of the epistles, to preach the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, why would I say something like that? Well, what you don't know is Paul did that. Paul didn't have the gospel of Matthew. Paul didn't have the book of Romans. He had to write that himself, <laughs> and along with all the rest of them. The early preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, all they had were the Hebrew scriptures, the 39 books of the Old Testament. But in those scriptures, they had eternal life. It was preached to them. Uh, another uh, absolute sad thing that's happened to our generation and our locality is that we sit in a place where we are literally in the shadow of an institution which for a hundred years has given a scheme or a lens through which Scripture is interpreted. And it's the dispensational premillennial system of Dallas Theological Seminary, which came to Texas in the 1920s as Texas Evangelical Theological College because basically it had been run out of Philadelphia by Westminster Seminary and, and, and all the Presbyterians up there. There's about 30 Presbyterians because it was a an aberrant scheme. It misunderstood 
the interpretation of the New Testament in terms of Christ, not in terms of national Israel. And we are all heirs of that. I grew up in Dallas Seminary. I went to Schofield Church. I had a Schofield Bible. I didn't do anything until I was in college. In fact, I was in seminary before I finally laid my Schofield Bible aside and picked up a, uh, an American standard, I think is what I used, and went from there with, with Scripture translations. And so we've had to, to, to constantly show in our preaching in this part of the world to people that Israel is God's people. That's all the people God ever had. He called them through Abraham. We talked about that last year, all the way through. And then when Christ came, he fulfilled in Christ everything that he had promised Israel. And Israel found its completion and its fulfillment and its absolute apex, the epitome in Christ Jesus. That's what the New Testament tells us over and over. Christ himself said that. Those people in the Old Testament were God's people. They were the church, the ecclesia of God, the congregation of God. And all that happened in the New Testament was that the Jews received everything that God had promised them in Christ. And then there was a problem. They began to look at the Scriptures and they began to listen to the Holy Spirit and they began to understand that, hey... This good news is not just for Israel. It's for the Gentiles also. And the nations, the Gentiles, the ethnic groups of all the other peoples that had been completely um, uh, written out and ignored, the pagan peoples for, for centuries, the salvation that's in Christ, the Messiah of Israel, is also for the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are to be grafted in to the olive tree, and they are to become part. What I want to tell you as we get to this a couple of verses, I'm, I'm setting this all up because when I get here and tell you what some of this stuff means, you're going to say, oh, no, 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 no. That's not that's not what that means. About half this room is going to disagree with most of this sermon, <laughs> which is pretty good percentages for me. <laughs> uh, but really, when we, we get right down to it, you'll see that God works in Israel, works everything out in Israel. He's the God of Israel. He's the God of salvation. And all that happens is, is the, 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 that Israel receives the salvation that God had promised when Christ comes. He comes bringing that kingdom of God in that messianic age, the last days, the fulfillment of all things, the great yes, the great affirmation, the affirmative to all the promises all the promises are in Christ or yes and amen. And then the Gentiles are all plugged into that. So the church was a Jewish outfit from the days of Abraham. And it's a Jewish outfit in the days of Jesus. The church, salvation is of the Jews. It's to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. So the good news, and if you read your New Testament, the book of Galatians, the book of Hebrews, the book of Romans, and some of the, some of the teachings of Jesus, Peter, that's a struggle for those Jews to realize that, hey, all these wonderful things that God promised Abraham, that he's now fulfilled in the seed of Abraham, the seed, Christ, and it's all ours. And you mean we have to let the Gentiles in too? You mean the Gentiles are part of the world? They can come in, but they've got to be circumcised. They've got to, and, and that's the whole debate in the New Testament is the admission of the Gentiles into the church. Let me give you a perspective on it that'll help you. Two or three times in this little lesson, I'm going to mention Acts, the book of Acts, chapters 1 and 2. And we've already mentioned chapters 8 and 9 when we talked about the prophecies, how God promised to, to restore the coastlines. And we looked at all the, the places, the, the cities of Philistia, the cities of Tyre and Sidon up the coastline. Then we looked south to Cush or Egypt. We looked north to Assyria and Babylon. And we look west, uh, I'm sorry, east to uh, uh, Ammon and Moab. And God promised that he's going to do something to bring those enemies of Israel into the fold as well. When you get to the book of Acts, everything that was spoken of in the Old Testament has been is fulfilled in that great harvest festival. It's what Pentecost is. It's harvest. And that harvest festival was the God's bringing to harvest 
All the things that had been sown and planted and cultivated in the Old Testament, now it had, it had all come to harvest. And God established His church with His people there on Pentecost, and it was the followers that He had had with Him, His closest followers, His apostles and the very near apostolic band, 120 people or so in an upper room, and said, this is the true Israel of God, this is the true people of God, and you are my people, and I am your God, and it's all fulfilled. And then you notice God start adding to the church daily as should be saved. And the first part of the book of Acts was everybody in Judea and Jerusalem, all Jews, Peter preached men and brethren, men of Israel. He was preaching to the Jews. He was preaching salvation of Jesus Christ. None other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And it was the gospel message preached to the Jews that they believed in fulfillment of all the Old Testament, but specifically ones that are named Joel. And, and Zephaniah is not named in the New Testament as a quotation, but you'll see it. And then God adds... And where the problem started was when God started adding Gentiles. Cornelius. <laughs> a lot of trouble there. The man was a Roman, you know. And, then, and the Ethiopian eunuch. Oh, real trouble there. <laughs> and you know the story. One, they began to add them in and it became an issue. And within the first dozen years of the church, from the day of Pentecost up until even it began to write the Gospels, and began, Paul began to write his epistles. From 30 A.D. up to early, late 40s, uh, in early 50s A.D., a period about 15 or 20 years in there, we've got this, this debate going on about, what about the Gentiles? Well, if you're dispensationalist, you say, I don't worry about them, it's a whole new thing. You know, God's going to set Israel aside, put it on a great prince, he's going to bring in the church, and this is, this is now the church age. No, it's just God's going right down that thing. It's just, it's, it's Israel all the way. And when you get the book of Revelation, how is heaven and all the eternalities that are described, they're described in term of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel are on the names of the gates of heaven. And just go down the line. You take the 12 tribes of Israel, square it, multiply it so that it's square, and then make a times a thousand, which is a, a, a phrase that's used in the Old Testament, highly symbolic Language, but nevertheless tells you what you need to sell. A thousand is the totality. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Do you think he doesn't own the cows on the thousandth and oneth hill? <laughs> <laughs> and we got this 12 times 12, 144 squared times a thousand, 144,000. That's the totality of the people of God. That's the popular. Is it literal? I hope not. There's 144,000 Christians probably in Dallas County alone. <laughs> but, it, but it expresses what needs to be expressed. So backing up and getting this scheme. Now hopefully I've, I've spent about 20 minutes and hopefully I've saved ourselves about 30 minutes. <laughs> so that when I mention these things, you've got a framework for hearing it. So now we come to chapter 3. And, and here's a woe. And a woe means death upon you. When you say, woe is me, and it's like, I, I, I feel like I'm going to die. And by the way, this is not the first woe we saw. We saw one back in chapter 2, verse 5, when the Lord began to talk to all of those Gentile nations about how He was going to destroy them, but then how He was going to restore their fortunes there in, uh, in verse 7. Restore the fortunes of the Gentile neighboring nations, the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Cushites, the Assyrians, Babylonians, etc. And he's pronounced a woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast in 5. Now when he comes to chapter 3, verse 1, he comes to his second woe. The first woe covered all the Gentile nations, all the enemies of Israel, and what would be their uh, future. Now he comes to talk about the city. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled. This is a prophecy now against Jerusalem, and you'll be able to see as you go through here, he's talking about Jerusalem. So now the prophet Zephaniah, who lives in Jerusalem, is prophesying in Jerusalem, probably like most of the prophets preached in the environs of the temple. We know Ezekiel did, we know Jeremiah did, we know Isaiah did, and probably the others did too. 
they would preach in the great courtyards of the temple uh, in, in that day. Of course, that was Solomon's temple before it was destroyed by the Babylonians. By the way, that's where Jesus preached. By the way, that's where Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. In other words, that the Word of God goes out from Zion. Zion's hill is that elevated place, that mount, that place where Abraham offered Isaac, that place where David bought a threshing floor to, to make a big base, a foundation for building the temple, the one that David paid for it and then Solomon built the temple on it. It's a singular spot on earth. It's the holy place. It's the place where all the, when God talks about the gospel. The gospel goes out from Zion, out from Jerusalem. All the events of the crucifixion and burial and resurrection of Christ took place in Jerusalem. In other words, it is, the, it is the, the central place. It is the capital city of the people of God. And it never changes. It still is. Not Palestinian Jerusalem, but the heavenly Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven in the book of Revelation, which is the bride of Christ, which is the church, which is Israel, the wife of Jehovah. So now he's prophesying to the church. Oh, I can't let that first phrase go. I've got to preach a little here. <laughs> Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled. Legally, the church is rebellious. Morally, the church is defiled. That's who he's preaching to now, folks, is the church. I liked it better when he was preaching to the Philistines. I didn't mind a bit when God said he was going to destroy all those nasty sodomites. But now he's talking to the church. He's talking to Jerusalem. He's talking to his people. And he calls them legally rebellious and morally defiled. The oppressing city. And here's what he says about her, verse 2. Talking about Jerusalem. Talking about the church. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Could that be true of us? Listens to no voice, accepts no correction. I haven't heard the church try to give a whole lot of correction in my late lifetime. For the most part, preachers just let us live the way they will to. I haven't heard too many preachers stand up and tell us how we ought to have godly, holy, sacrificial, Christ-centered living. Amen. I don't hear preachers preach about that. I don't preach about it much, and I don't hear many of the other guys doing it either. We're not even given correction. We're accepting no correction. We live the life the way we want to. We live where we want to. We do what we want to. We spend our money the way we want to. We marry who we want to. We divorce who we want to. We... Anyway, she does not trust in the Lord. No, trust in riches, trust in power, trust in name, trust in politics, trust in government. Just don't trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Drawing near is the, the umbrella term for worship. It's approaching God with a sacrifice and with a prayer. And when the sacrifice is made, the incense that's put upon it is the smoke that goes up, and that's the prayer of the saints. So, so in our worship, we are not drawing near to the Lord. You can be traditional, never draw near to the Lord. You can be classical and never draw near to the Lord. You can be contemporary. You can be emergent. You can be progressive. You can be liberal. You can be all kinds of stuff in your worship style. Never draw close to the Lord. And this is the Lord's perspective. He's saying to the church, you just don't do any of that stuff. Now I need to move on. You know we can always camp out and pitch a tent in any one of these verses, but let's move to verse 3. Now he's going to talk about the officials that are within her. So he's going to bring it right down to the leadership of the church in the next two verses. Her officials within her are roaring lions, her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane that which is holy. They do violence to the law. The first two talks about the civil government, the officials and the judges. 
Basically, they are in the business of exploitation. They live off of bribery. They live off of tax money that's stolen, that's extorted. And her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Probably the worst thing you can do, and God deals with Ezekiel, especially as a prophet on this, is for a watchman on a wall not to cry when the enemy comes. Not to recognize the enemy. Not to admit that there is an enemy. The watchman on the wall has failed. And what the Lord says he, in Ezekiel, he says, I'm going to hold the watchman responsible. If the watchman cry out when the enemy is at the gate, then the watchman is exonerated. I won't hold him accountable for the blood. But if he doesn't cry out and the enemy comes in the gate and ravages the people and destroys my flock, then I'm going to hold the watchman. I'll tell you right now, that's why as old as I am, I'm still up here trying to preach. It's because I want to be some kind of a watchman on the wall to send a signal of a warning. I'm going to, I don't care anything about a Presbyterian board that much. I'm not worried too much about, about church courts. I try to be in compliance and obedience and subservience to any church court I'm in. But all I'm doing these days is thinking about the judgment seat of Christ, the great Bema. And when I think about myself standing in that place, I am such a failure in my ministry, it scares me to death. And, I, and one more time, I've got to call on the mercy of the Lord and forgiveness and grace. And it's abundant and it's there. And that's the only hope I've got. But by God's grace, I'm not going to let another sermon slip by without just telling you there's an enemy outside. The enemy's at the gate. There's an enemy in our denomination. There are enemies in our church who are not holding faithful to the things of the Lord, who are letting things slide. They're fickle. That's what they are. They're fickle. The prophets are fickle. I'd make a good title for a sermon, The Fickle Prophet. <laughs> but even worse, her priest, this is her ministers, by the way. We, we do prophetic things when we preach. We do priestly things when we pray. We do kingly things when we administer and lead. Her priest profane what is holy. The precious things of the Lord are made ordinary. We just serve communion. We just... Bow our heads and pray. We, we are not trembling before our Lord. Well, that's the officials within her, verse 3. Verse 5, the Lord within her. Oh, that's, that's good to know. We not only have these, these weak and failing officials within our gates, these prophets and these priests and these, these officials within our church, but we've got the Lord within our church. That's the precious promise. He doesn't leave us nor forsake us. He's always here. The keeping of the promise is I will be in your midst. I will be with you. You will be my people. I'll be your God. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And so the Lord in, the, in our midst is, is within us. Here's what the Lord is. The Lord within her is righteous. Notice the, the forensic or the legal character to these things that it says about God. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. I bet everybody here knows that the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. Do you know the judgments of the Lord are shown forth every morning? And each dawn he does not fail. Doesn't fail in judgment, doesn't fail in scrutiny, doesn't fail in, in evaluation. But the unjust knows no shame. See, the forensic nature here of what's being talked about is the Lord has a law and he calls his people to obedience. And not one jot or one tittle of that law has been abrogated. In fact, it's all been intensified, fulfilled in Christ, and it's been impressed upon us. And the Lord is keeping accounts, making case files on each one of us based on His righteous judgments. 
Now, our problem is in our lifetime, this is my opinion, <laughs> our preaching and our teaching and our religion has become therapeutic. How do we heal our hurts? How do we deal with our brokenness? How do we deal with our feelings? How do we deal with all of the issues in our life where we are uncomfortable and maybe we're in some kind of misery? So most preaching that I've heard since the middle of last century coming forward and I've been listening to preaching is therapeutic. Now there's nothing wrong with that. I am thy God. I heal thy diseases. But what I haven't heard much of is the gospel and the word of God in terms of forensics, in terms of law, in terms of guilt and innocence, in terms of judgment and condemnation, in terms of pardon and justification. And that's what's happened. That's what's going on with the fickle prophets. The fickle prophets are only preaching peace, peace. And by the word, it's shalom, which means health. We've been preaching therapeutically, not righteous. But the Lord in our midst is righteous. Uh, Jeremiah 8. Let me see if I, yeah, I've got time. Let me just read. I'm just going to skip through and read one portion of one chapter out of Jeremiah. By the way, Jeremiah comes along preaching uh, chronologically after Zephaniah. About a half of a century later is the prophecies of Jeremiah to the same people, preaching right there in Jerusalem, preaching right there to the same, to the same church. Jeremiah 8, and I'm going to start and just uh, hop, skip, and jump through the, ver through the thing there. Um, it's all good. <laughs> it's all the Word of God. It's just, I want to hit a few highlights. You shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord, When men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? When have you heard that word in a pulpit lately? <laughs> backsliding. That's mean approaching the Lord and then sliding back, going back. It's easy to slide. It's harder to climb. And that's what, what's going on here. And notice he calls it a perpetual backsliding. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I have paid attention and listened, but they've not spoken rightly. No man rightly relents of his evil, saying, what have I done? Did you catch that part there where the Lord says, I have paid attention and listened. The Lord's been, been auditing our worship services. He's been auditing our prayer meetings. He's auditing this meeting today. We think we're outside the presence of the Lord, but we're not. He's been listening and he knows what's been going on in all of our meetings. No man relents of his evil. That's repentance. Saying, what have I done? Everyone turns to his own course like a horse plunging headlong into battle. And then he talks about the, the stork knows, its, knows the heavens, knows the times, the turtle dove, the swallow, a mention, a fourfold mention of the, of the uh, fowls of the air, said, but my people know not the rules of the Lord. If you listen to so much of what we say in our, in our conversations, we would think the Lord doesn't have any rules anymore. It's just love. Just the leading of the Spirit. Just kind of an amorphous molasses Coat it over with the sugar and do what you want to. But my people know not the rules of the Lord. I'll bet you if we would sit down and draw up a list of, say, 50 Old Testament commandments and precepts of the Lord, stand, statutes, judgments. You remember all the words that are used in the 119th Psalm? The ways of the Lord, the judgments, the statutes, you know. <clears throat> I bet if we drew up 50 of them right out of the Bible, quoted them, and we read them off in a classroom, half the people would think that half of them weren't even in the Bible. I don't believe that. And that's what the Lord says. My people know not the rules of the Lord. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? And behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. You know how Jesus rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees in his day? We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. He does that in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Isaiah. 
doing it 600 years earlier. These lying pen of the scribes, the wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken. Behold, they've rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? I'll just use one illustration, and it's current. Within the last few years, our denomination, PCA, is a serious issue in our midst. We have an openly gay pastor of a prominent PCA church in St. Louis, Missouri, and he has been doing things to justify his, his uh, situation as a gay person. And it's called Side B Christianity. And we have had now, we would have had four, but I mean five, but we've had four general assemblies. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, four general assemblies since he came out. And he's still pastoring. Now, we're working on it. What, what we did a few years ago was we had a committee that did a big old huge, long, multi-page, excellent, excellent study on human sexuality. And it's wonderful. Every word of it is great. And it's spelled out. And our elders have got it and they've read it. And it's, uh, you can't find a better document talking about what the Bible says about human sexuality, including condemnation of homosexuality as an abomination and a sin before the Lord. No, no fault with that paper. And it's widely read, widely recommended. But this man's still in the pulpit. And there's been a couple of small cases, but they've been dealt with oh, technicalities and so forth. We passed a couple of, uh, of amendments to the Book of Church Order we smithed and wordsmithed and crafted and put some uh, overtures together and everything to finally get something that would kind of uh, uh, disavow him and do something about him. And we passed it around to the Presbyteries this past year and it slightly failed. So there's no judicial procedure. There's no, and, and, and the, the phrase that came to my mind when I talk about how we write this long, beautiful paper, wonderful and true, very helpful. And we write these overtures and we craft these motions and we've done all this wordsmithing and all this talking, all this writing. It says the, the pen of the scribes. And yet he still stands and preaches. And he's got a gathering more, you know, credibility. And whenever votes are taken, it's like a 55-45 split on things that are affirmative for him or negative toward him. In other words, he still loses the big, the big, the big uh, votes, but it's that close. And the only thing I could think of is thinking of the PCA and its writing of this big paper and our denomination dealing with these overtures and these amendments and motions and amendments to church or the book of church, right? The Lord would say, this people honoreth me with their scripts, but their hearts are far from me. That may be one of our problems. But I just mentioned that so that you won't think I'm just up here talking about the Baptist. <laughs> because the Baptist asked the question as they ended their convention, what is a pastor? Now we've been asking now for about a year, a Supreme Court justice nominee was asked the question, what is a woman? And she couldn't give a good answer. And... The Baptists are asking the question, what is a pastor? And we had one ask in our General Assembly. There was a guy bringing an overture in which he was trying to get some, some of the parties within the denomination that had been trying to get people on the committees and, you know, some of the politicking that goes behind uh, the, the meetings. In Presbyterian order, all of our stuff supposed to be out in the open. Because we're not supposed to politic and, and, and decide things behind closed doors. We're supposed to debate it in session meetings locally, Presbyterian meetings, General Assembly, let everybody speak, everybody be heard. We have tremendous rules of, of, of decor. You know, you can't call a brother a liar even if he's standing there lying. Which, of course, you know, the apostles, Paul got to call people liars, but, but we can't. <laughs> and no, if you do, you're, you're out of order and you're, you're sent out. So we, ha we have this, th these procedures that, we're, that we're, we're going through and that we're doing all of this. 
but it just takes, it takes forever to get people on board to think about it. There's all kinds of rationales. You wouldn't believe the devices. I like that passage of scripture says, well, the Lord created man upright and man has thought of many devices. <laughs> and that's what it is. You wouldn't believe the different angles. Well, in the, in the, in the process of the, of the debate, the, word, the man used the word factions. There are factions within our um, denomination. And the moderator humorously rebuked him and said, well, I really don't know what a faction is. So the Presbyterians don't know what a faction is. I'd recommend 1 Corinthians chapters 1, 2, and 3. <clears throat> but nevertheless, that's, that's some of the stuff. I said I'd use one example, and that's all I'm going to use. Listen to what verse 11 says in Jeremiah 8. They have healed the wound of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And here's one of the sad things about, about the sinfulness of, of our hearts in a church. When they were, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Like the abomination previously mentioned? No, they were not ashamed at all. They don't, do not, did not know how to blush. You are hardened in your sin when you don't have a blush anymore. That's one of the things that thoroughly disgusted me about Bill Clinton and his administration. The nasty things that that man did and he didn't even blush. And everything we've heard about the stuff in our land and in our church, people aren't even embarrassed. It doesn't even, it doesn't even make them blush. Therefore they shall fall among the fallen, says the Lord. Oh, by the way, verse 13, as the Lord says, when I come together... Uh, there's no grapes. When I come to the fig tree, there's no figs. Even the leaves are withered. And when I give them, uh, see, and what I gave them has passed away from them. You remember when Jesus cursed the fig tree in his ministry and all the leaves withered? That was a sign. That was a sign that the Lord had just backed off and let them go into their own destruction. Let them fall. I remember when we came to that passage, we we heard several different interpretations of it. I thought it'd be nice if you just go back and find the verse in the Old Testament that sets up the picture of the withered, leafless, dead fig tree. And, and there it is. Why do you sit still? Gather together. Let us go into the cities and perish there. For the Lord has doomed us to perish and has given us poisoned water to drink. Because why? Why has God done all this horrible stuff? Because we have sinned against the Lord. We looked for peace, but no good came. For a time of healing, but behold, terror. And then he, he goes on about how he's going to send different kinds of punishments. One of them is in verse 17. I'm sending among you serpents, adders that cannot be charmed, and they will bite you, declares the Lord. You remember Israel in the wilderness? The poison, the poison serpents? That's from one of those... And then, and then uh, finally in that chapter it says, Is the Lord not in Zion and her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images and with their foreign idols and with their false worship? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. In other words, time is running out. I'm starting to hear some preachers that I respect, and, and, they're, and they're starting to talk about how we've passed the point of no return in this country that we can repent all we want to and the church can just lay themselves out with all kinds of repentance. But as far as they can tell, God's not going to listen to us anymore. We've had enough time to come to the Lord. And I hope these guys are wrong, but I'm telling you, they're the men that stay faithful to the Word of God. And that might be the message. Remember, that's, that was the, the problem in, in Jeremiah. Isaiah preached, if we'll just trust the Lord, the Lord will deliver us. And the Assyrians came, Sennacherib came, and they assaulted the, the city of Jerusalem and God came in there and smote the Assyrians and God delivered Jerusalem. Isaiah said, God will deliver us. And he did. Then 125 years later, the Babylonians are coming and they're assaulting Jerusalem. And all the false prophets are standing up preaching Isaiah's sermons. The Lord's going to deliver us. You know what happened. Poor old Jeremiah was saying, we're past that point. The harvest is past. 
We're not saved. Summer's over. The good times are, are gone. We're moving out in, into, the, in, into the rougher days. And, and then verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 1, here's Jeremiah. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. That's why Jeremiah was a crying prophet. It wasn't because he had an emotional problem. It was because he had sat there and seen the people persist in their sin and in their idolatry and in their slovenness. They've had one general assembly after another and they've not taken care of it. We have sinned against the Lord and we have not relented. We have not turned back. This people has turned back with a perpetual backsliding. And so Isaiah starts crying. I mean, I'm sorry, Jeremiah starts crying. He cries so much he writes it up in a book. Lamentations. The Lamentations of Jeremiah is him in lament. Well, anyway, let me get back to, we're on Zephaniah, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go to verse 6. We finished there with talking about uh, the unjust knows no shame. We saw that Jeremiah said they, they don't blush. They don't know any shame. He said, I, will, I have cut off the nations. Their banishments are in ruins. I have laid waste their streets so that no one walks him in the cities are made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more they're eager to make all their deeds corrupt. The Lord's kind of scratching his head. If we can be anthropomorphic and not be too irreverent, the Lord's kind of scratching his head. Look at what I've done. I've warned them. I've destroyed people. I've, I've, I've done everything you can think of. And, and they still, they still just keep on wanting to, they're eager to make all their deeds corrupt. They insist on sinning. You know why? Because they really don't believe there's any judgment. They really don't believe there's any consequences. They've, they've heard Paul say, what? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And they've answered the question, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sin. God's gracious, oh, he's good. He's, he's grace, grace, grace. We'll, we'll name our church. It's, you know, it's just, that's not the whole counsel of God. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey, for my decision is to gather the nations, to assemble the nations, to pour out upon them my indignation and all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. Remember how we started this book? It says, I will utterly sweep away. I will sweep away man and beast. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth. Well, the Lord, after all of this, says, this is my, my decision is to gather the nations. The Lord's already let us know what, what he's already made up his mind to do. Let's keep going, see if we can find a, a little hope in this. Yeah, verse 9, this last paragraph. And I'm going to suggest to you that this paragraph, because I'll read it, and, and, uh, and I, if you haven't already changed your thinking, you need to start changing your thinking. You need to start hearing this in New Testament terms because what I'm going to read is a description of what happened in Acts chapter 1 and 2. Acts chapter 1 and 2, strategic in your Bible, coming out of the Gospels and now going, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. And this is where the Lord fulfilled all of this good stuff that He's going to talk about now is when He came and by His mighty Spirit constituted His people as, in, in, as fulfilled in Christ, whereas they called upon... Now listen, and I'll give you some references as we go. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a, good, to a pure speech. First thing the Lord's going to do is going to do something with the tongue. Okay? That all of them may call upon the name of the Lord. Do you remember Peter's preaching at Pentecost? He quoted Joel, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The pure speech, the tongues, is 
calling upon the name of the Lord and the gospel <laughs> proclamation. It is a historical event that God sent as a sign to his people. With the people of other nations, well, I speak to this people. This people are in Jerusalem, and I'm bringing in those from the diaspora, from all the nations. They're listed in the book of Acts. They come from Rome. They come from all over the known world, the Mediterranean, uh, ancient world. And they come to Jerusalem, and in that occasion, they, they, the disciples are speaking in tongues, and the people there are hearing the, the, the sermon and the message, the word of God in the language, in their own language. This is not some gibberish. This is not some mysterious language. This is a spoken language. Now, I'm not going to deal with tongues in its entirety right now, except to point out that that was historical. And that was a sign, and it was a once for all sign, just like so many of the signs were. Pentecost was just as important as the Day of Atonement. The Holy Spirit fulfilled Pentecost, Christ fulfilled Pentecost just like he fulfilled the great day of atonement upon the cross, just like he fulfilled the Passover and, and all the other historical fulfillments of the great Old Testament promises. And all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. You remember the book of Acts chapter 2 where it says they were all, I mean chapter 1, they, about verse 14, they were all together together in one accord that's that unity that God brought them together. This is the, the concentrating of all of God's people had finally come down to a tiny little remnant. And it's going to be described in this passage. The people of God had been destroyed in Babylon. They'd been destroyed in the diaspora. They'd been destroyed in so many ways. Unbelieving Israel had been taken care of by God. He was going to take care of them in a really big way in about 40 years more when, when 70 AD, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem completely, wiped out the whole nation of Israel, wiped out their government, wiped out their priesthood, wiped out their temple, their religion, and everything there is when he finally brought the final destruction. But the Lord is saving them now. By the way, salvation always comes before judgment. 30 A.D., Christ was, was raised from the dead. 70 A.D., 40 years later, a generation, this generation shall not pass until these things are fulfilled. And 70 A.D., which is described, tells us God's punishment. It had been predicted back in the book of Daniel and other places, but God finally finishes it out. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. This is the diaspora, the dispersed ones, returning back to Jerusalem. Amen. On that day, you shall not be put to shame. Whosoever, believe, whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Another parallel is whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall not be ashamed, shall not be confounded, shall not be confused, shall not be uh, uh, fooled or tricked in any way. It's an authentic calling upon the Lord. On that day you shall not, put to, be, not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled me. And it was even though this people's rebellious, God's going to say, for then I will remove from your midst, he's going to be your proudly exalted ones, you shall be... Uh, no longer be haughty in all my holy mountain. This is what Jesus dealt with his entire public ministry was to get those scribes and Pharisees, that Sanhedrin, that haughty religious group of men to humble themselves before the Lord and to come to, to him for faith and to put their faith and trust in Christ. He was their true savior, their true high priest. He was the true lamb of God. He was a true vine of, of, of the Israel. He was everything that that God had promised to give them and he wanted them to believe. That's why Jesus spent so much time preaching to, arguing with, pleading with the Sanhedrin. But what did they do? They by wicked hands crucified and slayed him. And, and this is it. It says, I'm going to bring, because there's not going to be a haughty person in all my holy mountain. The only people that are going to be in God's, it says, but, verse 12, I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. This is, the, this is the population of the remnant of Israel. Everybody there was a remnant. Peter was a Jew. John was a Jew. Mary was a Jew. Mary Magdalene was a Jew. Joseph of Arimathea was a Jew. Nicodemus was a Jew. Everybody in that first band of believers were the, were the humble and the lowly they shall seek 
the refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel. This is that little group of people there in Acts is the remnant of Israel down to just a tiny small, unless the Lord had left us a remnant, we would have all been destroyed, says Paul in Romans 9. And that little remnant of just a few souls, a few score people that had followed Jesus faithfully to the very end, now were constituting Israel. The real Israel, the true Israel, the survivors, a people humble and lowly that seek refuge in the name of the Lord. What did Peter say in that sermon? Every, every syllable of that sermon is loaded with historical narrative. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that, that's why he preached there in Pentecost. And that's what he's saying here, that they are, that they are uh, uh, seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, listen to what it says about them. They shall do no injustice. They shall speak no lies. In other words, what will be inculcated into this little group these believers in Christ, these Christians now, this remnant of Israel, the true Israel, the rest of Israel is, is, had been destroyed and was being in the process of being destroyed. This little group right here have righteousness and truth. There's no injustice. There's no lies. Righteousness and truth. Nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. Tongues. God cleaned them up. He did what he said he was going to do back there in verse 9. I will change the speech of the people to a pure speech. Nothing is more important than a believer in Jesus Christ than truth. Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus prayed, sanctify them with truth. 